here with him and glad to be with all of you. Dr. Lee, thank you for hosting us and having us here. Um, I'm told you're smart kids with a lot of interests and questions, so I'm going to try not to talk too much. And you can ask me anything you want to. And if I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. I mean, I'll uh, tell you so. Um, so I, uh, I spent my career in the US Foreign Service, the diplomatic corps of the United States. Uh, and I kind of always wanted to do this, uh, except for when I decided I wanted to be a professor of comparative literature for a couple years. And then I changed my mind back to being an American diplomat. So uh, I came back to where I belonged. Um, and I served a lot of my time in China uh, from the early days of economic reform in China, when China was coming out of tight Communist Party control like, of everything. Couldn't buy a train ticket without permission from the party. Uh, to times when China was sort of Wild West economics, uh, now unfortunately heading back towards more party control. Uh, but I also then kind of bumped into this job as spokesman for the State Department. Um, you know, somebody I knew recommended me to somebody who was looking for a deputy and we hit it off and it worked out. It's a lot of life is like that, I guess. So I ended up talking about the whole world um, and being on the podium at the State Department behind the seal with the lights on for a good part of my life. Now, none of us uh, joined the Foreign Service to be the longest serving anything. Uh, we joined the Foreign Service so we could change jobs every two or three years. Uh, so I tell people it's a good job for people who can't keep a job. Um, and you can move from one thing to another, sometimes move regions, at least move responsibilities uh, every couple of years. Uh, but I did end up being long-serving spokesman because it was constantly interesting. Um, China, you know, it's this big issue right now, and you read a lot of stuff about how China's going to eat our lunch and take over the world and all this sort of stuff. And I, I'm old enough to remember when Japan was going to eat our lunch, uh, when, you know, Japan was going to be number one. Uh, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen for a variety of reasons, both demographic and social, but also because of the resilience of America, because of the ability of America and Americans to reinvent ourselves. And I guess, you know, in the end, I think our position in the world matters a lot more on us and how we behave and how we take care of our own business. Uh, China is a powerhouse. They're going to be a player. They're going to be a big influence on your lives as you go forward. Uh, but they also have their own problems. They've got declining population. Uh, they have rising wages. So business was moving out of China anyway to places like Vietnam, Bangladesh, uh, Ethiopia, um, and they had to sort of upgrade their quantity, their information, their technology, and their industry. Uh, and they're kind of still at that inflection point where it's not quite clear how they're going to proceed. Um, you know, basic law of in, in economics is output is people times machines, right? Population times productivity. That's how people make things. And if you want to have growing output in, a, in an economy, you got to have more people and or more machines. So with a declining population in China, they got to have a massive upgrade in the level of their technology. Uh, they're getting some of it. We blocked parts of it. Uh, but it's not certain that they're going to be able to overcome that. And they may face, they'll certainly face lower growth, but they may even face declines in output and quality of life. Uh, which scares the Communist Party to death because their whole shtick has been, you know, abide by us, let us, get, let us govern you, and we'll give you better quality of life. So we'll see what happens. I, I think China will continue to be a player, as I said, be a factor in your lot. But they're not going to be an overwhelming force, so don't take everything you read about China at face value. But what about us? I think we're well positioned. Um, in the end, in a sort of technical economy, the quality of the workforce matters more than anything else. Um, the United States still has a creative workforce. We have a good education system, by and large. I wish it was better in many places, in many ways, but 
at least you're an example of what U.S. education can produce. And it's got an investment environment where there's money available for new companies and new ideas at all levels, whether it's small mom and pop things or, you know, huge, like Micron's building a new factory, somebody said today was $15 billion for a chip factory in Idaho. But we can come up with that and we can do cutting edge stuff in Idaho along with TSMC building another one, I think only $5 billion worth of factory in Texas. So the U.S. has a lot of resilience, has a lot of capability. The key, again, as in China, is the quality of the workforce. And that's like the only thing I really worry about in the United States. And I think we're still good, as I said, but I'm not certain of it. Um, and that's why it's good to come to MSU and see quality of the workforce, quality of the future workforce here. Um, I don't want to talk too long, but I, I guess in the end, you know, what matters, as I said, is how we take care of ourselves. There was an article, uh, some of you who study international relations have probably read it, called the X article, written by George Kennan, 1946, at the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. And it was about how to deal with the Soviet Union, with this communist society, dictatorship that had been an ally in the World War II, but now is going to be an opponent and a threat in the next era. And Kennan said at the time, you know, here's how to manage this, here's the Soviet system, here's how it's going to work, here's how to manage the problems, and it became the basis of containment. But he ends the article by saying, what really matters is the spiritual vitality that we demonstrate to the world. What an odd phrase. He said it means, a, can we demonstrate to the world we're a country that knows what it wants, that can take care of its own society, and that can develop a sp spiritual vitality that other countries want to emulate? Um, and I think that's true again. So in the end, it's not just us and the quality of our education and the quality of our technology. It's do we get our act together enough that other people want to play with us, want to be with us, want to work with us. And that's what's going to help us mold the world into the kind of place that we can thrive and the kind of place we want to live in. So I'm going to stop with that. Um, as I said, I've dealt with a lot of stuff in the world, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So have at it. Sir? How was your interaction with food? How was it like? It was not extensive. I was sitting in a chair and other people were interacting with the meetings. Uh, you know, he, he, he started out in St. Petersburg. He came out as kind of a reformer of St. Petersburg and moved to <coughs> Moscow and everybody said, okay, this is a new guy. Uh, we were talking today, uh, George W. Bush uh, met him in Bratislava and uh, said, I looked in his eyes and seen his soul which was a weird thing for an American president to say, but, you know, and it turns out he didn't see the part of the soul that had all the daggers out for people. But um, he's a KGB operative, so he can come across very well. He can come across as friendly when he's stabbing you in the back. Um, and m the impression was, you know, the one he wanted to create, which was of a man in charge, a man that was leading Russia into the future. Uh, I think, you know, the facts about how he was doing that sort of really started to emerge later. Uh, but there are, you know, a lot of nefarious deeds uh, that can be traced back directly to him. But yeah, he's a, a spy, a KGB operator that knows how to create a good impression when he needs to. That's kind of where we were left. Listen first, um, particularly intense and difficult situations. Um, we have a tendency to go into meetings as the United States of America and tell people what we want. Um, and there's always a funny moment at the beginning of a meeting. Uh, I used to note this all the time with Secretary Powell. Uh, when the host, when the country you're in would sort of say, 
you know, you're our guest here, why don't you, you know, speak first? And Powell got good, and I guess I got good in the end, at saying sort of very simple generalities about, you know, we're, we're here to build security for both countries, we want to talk to you about what's possible. We talk about economic security as well as anti-terrorism, stuff like that. Just generalities, and then turn it over to the other guy. Because when you start listening, you start hearing not just what does he want or she want, you start hearing how can I get what I want from this person? What are the parts of their, what, what are the things important to them that I can appeal to and sell my product or my ideas in a way that appeals to their interests? And so uh, listening first is really an important skill and not many of us have it. Uh, the State Department telegrams, the instructions to the field on what to do are derived from you know, World War II level era telegraphs, and it was in all caps. So everything we sent out to the field was in all caps. You know, like, you tell them this, this, and this. I don't know if it's still that way, frankly. I think they modernized the system. They have big letters and little letters now, which is a great leap forward. But there was this feeling like we're there to tell people what to do. And I think that's really bad. And um, I don't think the U.S. has to be shy in retiring. People do want to know what we want and what we, how we present it. But um, I think any time, whether interpersonal or international, um, listening is a really important skill. Yeah. Sure. Well, math and science. Um, you know, I, I got through life on 11th grade calculus. I guess that was that as far as I got in math and science. I wish I'd taken more. But I really do think that the more technical that the economy gets and the products that we sell and make, um, I, I guess, you know, having that foundation and having that method in one's head is really important. Um, it's odd to think of it that way because we've got these gizmos, you know, that like do it all for us, you know. You know hey, Google, build me a you know, build me a structure, and it's going to be, you know, talk to your 3D printer and say, build me a, a shed, or you know, I need a house, I need a wrench. But I do think kind of understanding how that stuff works is really important. So. Even if you're a liberal arts major, I was an English major. I learned how to write. That's a really good skill, too. But uh, I kind of think it always helps to have more math and science. Yeah. Thanks for taking my question, Doctor. Um, it seems like with the problems we're having with productivity and growth, uh, it seems like immigration should be such a welcome thing. What are your views on that? Um, output equals population times productivity, right? So we're real good at the productivity side, but the population side is not something the U.S. has thought about or emphasized. And one of the best things we do is we attract people from all over the world who want to live here. And that's one way of increasing population, and not just any population, but population that's skilled, that's trained, that's educated. Um, countries send us their smartest people who come to U.S. colleges. Uh, they're entrepreneurial people who come here want to start businesses. And you know, having been on the visa line in Taipei and other places like that, I've seen people who qualify for visas in the United States and uh, produce great things here. So I really think we ought to think of immigration, not just as family reunification, which we do, which is thoughtful, but really put more emphasis on attracting talent from all over the world. If we can do that as a society. We just have to let them in. Um, but we seem to blow hot and cold on that. 
you know, and if you look at Im U.S. immigration law, some places and sometimes we've had more people qualify and sometimes we've been <laughs> against it. And I think we just ought to admit, you know, there's always this proposal that people talk about is everybody who gets a Ph.D. ought to get an immigrant visa along with it if you're born in some other country so you can stay. And it's sort of a rhetorical thing in some political remarks, but I think we really ought to do it. Maybe even if you get a master's, you ought to get a bit of a visa, too. Sir? So I'm, I'm a real skeptic on Belt, Belt and Road, okay? It's a lot of money, uh, and, you know, uh, Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, I think he said, you know, when countries talk to the, United, to the United States, they get a lecture. When they talk to the Chinese, they get a port. So it does build China's reputation in the world. Um, China is, I wouldn't say they're pr promoting dictatorships. They are... Um, ecumenical. They accept anything uh, that they encounter. So, and you know, we've had periods when we did that too, and we didn't lecture all the dictators in Latin America about um, uh, about their human rights record, and we didn't lecture countries in the world as long as they were anti-Soviet. So, it's not an unheard of thing in international relations. But uh, Belt and Road is a interesting phenomenon because as economies reach a sort of domestic saturation you might say and an export saturation and you've seen this in Taiwan you've seen it in Korea you've seen it in Japan in the past they start gaining a surplus capital and they have to decide what to do with it not all of it gets reinvested domestically they start going overseas and they start investing overseas Japan is still investing huge amounts overseas more than the Belt and Road I think I haven't looked at the numbers recently uh, so, in a way, it's kind of a natural phenomenon, all right? It's also a phenomenon of Chinese enterprises that had uh, started to develop domestic surplus capital um, and looking for business opportunity. And so this natural thing that was happening, Xi Jinping came along and said, let's call it the Belt and Road. And they went out and started investing overseas. So in a way, it was a way of taking care of the needs of Chinese enterprises to find some place to put their, their capital uh, with government banking, right? Uh, and it became the slogan. It got put in the Chinese con constitution, you know, with Xi Jinping's name next to it. So it's his thing, right? So everybody, every project that a company was naturally going to do overseas every mine they were going to build for new raw materials, every uh, farm they wanted to buy and get wheat from, uh, became a Belt and Road project and they got brownie points from the communist hierarchy. So I don't see it as an unusual thing. I don't see it as a plot to take over the world. They're not trying to tell anybody what to do. They're just trying to make money and get raw materials. <coughs> so. Uh, you know, the, when I was, I worked for a while for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. And uh, the Chinese started inviting me to these conferences. First, under pre Xi Jinping, they were called going out con conferences, uh, where they were encouraging Chinese companies to start looking abroad and investing abroad. So, this is going on before Xi Jinping came along and built it and wrote it. Uh, but the reason they wanted somebody from the OECD to come to the conference was my job was to tell them, uh, when you go out in the world, uh, comb your hair, tuck your shirt in, don't pick your nose, you know, behave. And the OECD had the anti-bribery conventions, had the investment codes, had the labor standards. Uh, and all the things about how companies investing overseas should behave. So my job was to talk to the going out conference of all these Chinese companies that were interested in going overseas about these international standards that they would be expected to meet when they go in overseas to invest. So as I said, this has been going on. Um, 
I would say the standards that China applies to behaviors and investments, particularly when it comes to bribery, are not fully international standards. Um, I think they work well with dictators who take money on the side. Right? Cambodia is a great example. I don't know if you want to talk about specifics, but he can. Uh, but in the end, it was kind of a natural moment for China to start investing overseas and Chinese companies to start looking overseas, both for raw materials uh, and <coughs> some cases for markets. Uh, okay. A couple stories. A couple stories? Well, my experience with the Belt and Road, a couple, um, I was in Mozambique. Chevron had decided to leave, which I was, kind of, I was quite disappointed that I had the work to engage in the world. Um, but I was talking with a very senior government official who was really disappointed that Chevron was leaving. And I said, well, how come? You know, the Chinese are coming in, they just built you a whole port with all these beautiful petroleum tanks. And he goes, yes, those beautiful tanks. <laughs> Already after a year, the tanks were starting to tilt. Uh, the quality is not that great, um, a lot of what they're doing. Um, a lot of times they aren't sharing the technology with the local people. Um, they haven't done a great job, even though they're spending a lot of money in terms of building friends internationally. Um, I had another experience here in the U.S. Um, so either the Chinese ambassador, very senior, and you speak to an American audience, and someone asked him about how he felt about trade. He said, oh, we really like free trade. Seriously. You send us raw materials, we'll send you finished products. He said that to an American audience. It's bad enough. It, it, that's how they tend to think about things. Um, and that isn't winning them friends. Um, so, as Ambassador Boucher has mentioned, sometimes they'll, they'll do business a different way um, with terms of bribery. Um, so they, they, they've done a lot of good things. They've built infrastructure that's needed in a lot of places. Um, but I think their quality could be better uh, and their way of business, doing business could be better. It's kind of make work for Chinese companies. You know, Chinese companies, Chinese finance, Chinese loans, Chinese banks and somebody else is stuck with the bill. And then you see now these huge debts that countries have. Chinese clause in the Belt and Road contracts includes a no Paris clause. Paris is where countries that can't pay all their debts go to a debt renegotiation in the Paris, called the Paris Club, right? And so countries that get over their head with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the regional development banks, private banks, they, it all gets bundled together and they go and negotiate in Paris for a repayment schedule that lets them off the hook. China, China puts no Paris clause in their contracts. And so China's got a lot of debts out there that aren't going to get paid back. Uh, a lot of countries on the hook for stuff that uh, China <coughs> said, you want a port? We got the company, we got the finance, you know, and, you know, some kid down the road in your country, some grandchild. We have to pay the bill, and those are starting to come due. So, not a good thing. But some people like the railroads and the ports and stuff like that. Yeah. In Please. the context of uh, raw materials and China, do you think that the United States has any necessity to compete, or? even in less of a prospect of like uh, natural resources, do you think that the United States has a need to go out and make more connections in terms of economics more than they already have? Or do you think that we're in a good place? I mean, we're in the happy situation of having raw materials. I mean, Montana especially, right? You guys got rare earths, you got wheat, you got metals, you got uh, talent, you got tech, you got smarts, you got the whole package here, right? So, um, I, to some extent, China has that too. They've got a lot of, you know, natural resources. They're not as productive on things like agriculture because of the population pressures and the history and stuff like that. But um, 
They, uh, I don't think there's a real need to compete. Um, I suppose you can probably find some examples of rare earths where U.S. companies and Chinese companies are bidding against each other. But you know, that's business. So I don't, I don't think we have too much of a supply problem on raw materials because we can do most of it domestically, or at least between us and Canada, we can do it. Yeah. How come all the questions are on this side? <laughs> Am I not looking over here, is that it? Here, let's go here and then we'll go back to that side. How do you deal with political discourse when talking to international leaders? Like you mean domestic, like our political our discourse? Political. You know, there's a moment you just want to say, well, that's what we do. You know, and, and don't, don't worry about everything you hear during the campaign. Some of it will happen and some of it won't. Foreigners are fascinated by the American political process. And they're sometimes appalled by the American political process, just as some of us are too. Um, it, is, it is kind of funny when you're representing the United States overseas during an election year. Uh, because there tends to be this, <gasps> you know, sort of feeling among people, and you have to say, you know, let's wait till it happens and see what happens after the election and whoever gets elected. And I generally have found a remarkable continuity in U.S. foreign policy, including trade policy and investment and economic stuff, uh, from administration to administration. I've worked for Democrats. I've worked for Republicans. Um, I've been spokesman for the State Department during Democrats and Republicans uh, and never found anything that was too unusual. Um, uh, let me just say the period from 2016 to 2020 was probably an exception to that rule. But I think by and large we've, uh, we've had a remarkable continuity despite all the excitement of American politics. And when you're overseas representing the United States, you, know, you just kind of say, that's the way we do things. Let's see how it turns out. president who expressed his outrage at every little thing. Uh, we had a president who thought he could boss people around rather than negotiate. And we had a president who didn't know the word compromise. So rather than having, you know, when you represent the United States overseas, you have, you don't just represent the president, you represent the, the nation and the constitution. And having a congressional Congressional support for presidential policy can be very powerful. So, you know, we would get a lot of congressional delegations in foreign countries uh, that would support administration policy and that would be there to sort of reinforce the U.S. message. Um, and if you were negotiating with somebody, you could promise them, yeah, the president could get this through Congress. And that wasn't quite clear during the Trump presidency. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I still can't hear you properly. You know, in some ways you could say it doesn't exist anymore, right? So you go to Peru, and there are Chinese interests in copper mines, there's Japanese, you know, in, in interests in, in raw materials from South America that have been there for a long, long time. Uh, we don't decide who can come in and who can't. Um, but we still have, shall I say, a proprietary interest in the Caribbean. Latin America. Um, I, I don't think, you know, the, the Monroe Doctrine in terms of supporting coups uh, 
working with United Fruit on who gets to be in their government. I mean, I think that's all a thing of the past. But I don't underestimate the interest the United States has in Latin America and South America, and I think that's quite legitimate. That's geographic and cultural. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting sometimes when you go to big international meetings, your, your friends are your friends. And Latin America, big countries like Brazil, we work very closely with, even if they had moments when they wanted to oppose what Washington was saying. Uh, by and large, uh, we had a w similar way to view the world. They're sort of young upstarts against traditional diplomacy. So I don't completely discount it, but it's largely a thing of the past in, in terms of its more extreme examples. Sir? Is there going to be like any discussion with other countries about like topics that aren't economic or development based? Oh, sure. We spent, I mean, uh, I, you know, after my job as uh, spokesman at the State Department, Secretary Powell, um, Secretary Rice asked me to take the regional job for <coughs> Central and South Asia, so uh, India to Kazakhstan including Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I spent an awful lot of time dealing on counterterrorism issues. And it was everything from talking to dictators about don't put anybody, everybody in jail just because they pray five times a day to you got to help us get after this, this intelligence or this group that we think is you know, smuggling arms into Afghanistan. Um, so it there's a lot of counterterrorism and security interests. I'd say it's a little more balanced now with the economic and other interests, but that's still a major topic of discussion with a lot of countries around the world is, is security and counterterrorism issues. Um, and we're the United States of America. People turn to us for odd things. You know, my a lot of my time in Pakistan, I was conducting secret talks with President Musharraf, the military dictator, and Benazir Bhutto, the democratic leader in exile, on trying to help them manage a transition back to democracy in Pakistan. And they came to us and asked us to do that. It wasn't something we said, hey guys, I got a great idea. You ought to go back to democracy and we can help you do it. No. They came to us and said, uh, you know, Musharraf asked me, can you help us with a dialogue and guarantee the commitments that we make. And I went to Secretary Rice and said, this is what they're asking for. I think guarantee is a bit strong. So I told him I would witness commitments they make. So I was spent about a year bouncing around the world, having secret meetings with both of them in different places. And they would tell me what they talked about last time they talked. And they would tell me what kind of commitments they were prepared to make. And sometimes I would carry the message to the other one. And, you know, it, a whole lot of things happened. It didn't all work out. Benazir went back, and unfortunately, she got assassinated. I mean, she knew it was dangerous, but it was just terrible when she got shot um, or blown up. It was a bomb. But yeah, the people turned to the United States for things like that. You know, even though it's two Pakistanis talking to each other. Having the U.S. somehow involved gave them both a sense of confidence that it might work out. Um, and we're, I think that's an important thing that we can do that not everybody can do. Um, I help do some of the same things in Nepal for a democratic transition. And the Europeans were there too, but we seem to be the one that they really turn to for help in kind of working out some of these internal stuff. Yeah. yeah. How did you grapple with communicating and representing ideals you didn't believe in? Or ideals I didn't believe in? Yes. I don't think I ever had to do that. Um, you know, I, I, mean, I was spokesman for the State Department, so I guess I represented our policy in a lot of ways. But I don't think I ever felt a moment when we were, from 
promoting something or asking for something that we didn't think was founded in what was right. Um, other people had criticisms and other people, especially criticisms that we would espouse ideals and maybe not always look up to. But um, I, I do think the U.S. has a very principled foreign policy and has had that for administrations, both Republican and Democrat, for many years. We stand for something in the world, and people have always kind of looked up to us. And I think we still do that. Not always well. We have our own problems, but in terms of ideals, I don't think anybody had a problem with that. Yeah. Sir? Favorite place in terms of a moment in history, or yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I've loved Paris my whole life, but it has more to do with food than anything else. Um, I, you know, I kind of like. I don't want to say. Well, I will. The weird and exotic, you know, the places that are most different from what I'm used to, and so you know. Traveling around small towns in China, particularly at this moment of economic change, when you know, I remember when I was posted in Shanghai, I went down to a town called Wenzhou, and <coughs> Wenzhou is a coastal town, uh, long known for piracy, right? And I went down there to see the button market. It was the first sort of textile and button market, open market, where textile factories could buy buttons and zippers. You know, and I thought that was really cool. That was, you could just see the beginning of something taking place there. And so that sense of opportunity, that sense of change, that sense of, you know, the being at the foundation of something that was going to change a lot of people's lives, uh, that was exciting. And I bought a ripoff uh, pirated calculator that they'd made down there too, so piracy was still strong in Winjo. Uh, what would you say was, even if the event was just horrible or you thought it was terrible at the time, something that you really just don't regret at all now looking at it, back at it retrospectively? I, you know, I, I'm not sure this answers the question, but the most horrible thing that happened to us was 9 11. And, uh, how we reacted to that was extraordinarily complicated. And, and our initial reaction was withdrawing from the world. You know, it's dangerous out there. Don't go there. And I think the President, Secretary Powell, were able to sort of turn it out around sort of into cooperation with other countries saying, you know, it was NATO partners or people like Pakistan, saying that, you know, we're, we're all in this together and we have to protect ourselves and protect each other. And you don't do that by closing all the borders and keeping everybody out and going out to whack everybody who has a bad thought, but you do that by working with other countries to try to stabilize societies. So. I'm not, I mean, we did a lot of things wrong after 9-11. We overreacted in many, many ways. But in the end, I think the United States was sort of the foundation of a more secure future for all of us. And I guess that was a problem we didn't completely solve. But it's something that we figured out after the initial reaction, uh, how we could take the lead among other countries and stabilize things. I guess I'll stop at that. It's hard to say. I mean, we screwed up a lot of things. Never mind. <laughs> yes. Were you always interested in like foreign relations, or how did you kind of end up? Yeah. So my grandpa had been in the foreign service. Um, he was a uh, he was a kid from Eureka, South Dakota, and went to college in Minneapolis. And I guess actually he got drafted and was in World War I and then ended up in France. And so 
he uh, he came back from that, went to college, and had this worked at it for a congressman, and kind of that was, you know, there's that expression, how are you going to keep them back on the farm once they've seen Paris? Um, and that was kind of my grandfather's situation. He was overseas in World War One, and he liked it, so he joined. He managed to get in the foreign service, and so I grew up with his stories and my dad's stories of. Uh, Geneva and Rome uh, in the 20s and 30s. So I always had this idea, except when I went to college and then I decided I want to be a literature professor. Uh, and then I joined Peace Corps. Best thing I ever did. If you ever have the opportunity, join Peace Corps. I sat in the hot African sun for a couple years, taught, taught English to really smart students, and figured out, no, I didn't want to be a diplomat after all. And, uh, and that's when I started pursuing that, so. How is the foreign policy being affected by what's happening in Israel and Russia? In Israel. And Ukraine and Russia. And Ukraine and Russia. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of more a domestic political test for us than, uh, than an international one. I think the U.S. has always a, stood behind Israel. Uh, stood against people who kidnap and kill children. Uh, we've always defined Hamas as a terrorist group, and sadly they're showing it now on a massive scale. So I think it, you know, we're standing up for what we've always stood for in helping Israel um, and helping Israel deal with this. While if you notice what President Biden says is. You know, but we expect Israel to abide by the laws of war and common decency in their in their approach. And it's awful hard to go after a group as integrated and embedded as Hamas in the Gaza uh, with military force. Um, but the Israelis are very good at it. They ought to be able to do it. Um, Ukraine, it kind of sadly reminds us of the Cold War. Um, when we stood with democracies against Soviet communism. And Vladimir Putin, is that's what he represents, is sort of the old Soviet empire. That's what he misses. You know, and he sort of said, well, all these places used to be part of Soviet Russia, and we're, we're going to get them back. Well, no, you're not. These people have a right to be free. They have a right to decide their own destiny in the United States standing up for that. Uh, my only question is, is the U.S. Congress going to come through with the funding? Right now, the U.S. House of Representatives can't do anything. But, you know, fingers crossed, we'll get through that. And I do think the United States is going to stand up against terrorism and stand up against people who invade neighboring countries. Let's go back there and we'll come back up front. No, I mean, when you're ambassador, you know, I used to say I was the ping pong ball that the Cypriots used to hit back and forth, right? So uh, Cyprus divided island between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, I mean, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, south and north. Uh, the United States has always played a very important role in trying to manage the conflict, uh, trying to keep peace along what's called the Green Line, uh, and trying to help them negotiate a solution. And, you know, I used to have the solution written on a 3 by 5 card, because it was obvious how this was going to have to be settled. But, you know, I, I tell students, my students, policy is a whole lot easier than politics. And having the policy right wasn't the hard part. Getting the political situation on both sides to a point where they really wanted to make the deal and were willing to do what it took to make the deal was almost impossible. And my many predecessors have uh, had struggled with it and my successors have struggled with it as well. Um, now that Cyprus is in the European Union, the border is pretty porous. There's not much pressure on anybody to make the deal. Um, but yeah, you, 
bounce back and forth between Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. And one day they say, I'll do this if he does that. And you go to the other side and he, the other guy says, okay, I'll do that. And you go back to the first guy and he says, no, no, I don't want to do that. So at part of it was, I think, just by trying to make things better, we prevented them from getting worse. That makes any sense? So we had an important function, even though we didn't achieve anything. Nor had my 20 years of predecessors, nor have my 20 years of successors. Sage, that was just a might makes right sort of argument rather than a religious one. Um, I think some would accuse the United States of that. So you have to be a little careful. But no, we're, you know, we have principle as well as power. And I think when we deploy them together, we achieve more. So I, I don't think anybody that I've ever had to question, why are you doing this? I've never got the answer, because I can. I've always got the answer of, you know, we have citizens of danger, we have principle at stake, we have, you know, interests or, you know. I mean, a lot of, I haven't said this yet, so I'll say it now. Uh, foreigners are full of history, right? And so when you try to deal with situations, uh, Sometimes the answer is history. Uh, my boss at the beginning of the breakup of Yugoslavia when Croatia and Bosnia and everybody was starting to fight each other, Serbia. Uh, we sent out a delegation, Secretary Baker went out, my boss, spokesman at the time when I was deputy went out with him. And it was kind of a be nice, don't hit your brother kind of trip. Uh, and. Uh, she came back and I said, how'd it go? He said, you know, I was sitting at dinner with this guy and he had an Italian suit and a Ferragamo necktie gentleman. He'd worked in London, he'd worked in, you know, all over Europe. And she said, I turned to him and I said, pretty much the same thing, can't you guys just work this out? And he said to me, but you don't understand, in 1389, and she said, right then I knew it wasn't going to work. And a lot of people have history in their heads, right? 1389, 1433, you know, these dates that pop around the world. And they remember, like Putin does, you know, this is our God-given right to have Ukraine, Georgia, et cetera, as part of our territory. Catherine the Great had it, why can't I? Uh, I think, we, having invented ourselves much later after this history, we don't, you know, history is bunk for most Americans. Uh, but that's not true overseas. So you're always dealing with people who have history in their, in their heads. And I, I have to say, as an American diplomat, what I usually found was I didn't know enough history. Um, and I really, if you want to understand what other people are thinking and why they say the things they do, you have to understand a lot more of their history than most Americans know, at least than I knew when I showed up. Do you have a question down here? Yeah, thanks, Doctor. Um, if, I want to jump back to what you said about the speaker uh, situation going on. And so my question is, if this were a binomial experiment and GOP members were pass-fail, what are the, what's the probability that um, they're doing this on purpose to stop funding? Uh. I don't know. Uh, you know, what lurks in the mind of men, and they are men, uh, is unfathomable sometimes. I think I, there, there's a tendency to think that my personal interests are the national interest, 
and so people who have very personal interests in their power in Congress or in a committee or their re-election, well, that must be the national interest as well. So uh, I don't, uh, that's a human tendency, not just a members of Congress, but I do think it complicates the situation enormously. And we used to live in a political environment where getting things done was an important part of the job description, right? Where the word compromise was acceptable. And that's how deals were made. You know, where's Tip O'Neill now that we need him? There, he was a Democrat that was able to negotiate with the Republican president and get deals, get major legislation through. Obama was able to get major legislation to, through by cooperating and compromising with people in Congress who were willing to compromise. So s when compromise went out of the political lexicon, it's not the Republicans this, the Democrats that, it's the people who won't make a deal. Uh, I wish that would come back, I hope it comes back. <coughs> but that seems to me where the problem is. One more question, please. They have one right here. Yep. Um, so I learned French because of my experience when I was a kid. My dad worked for the Department of Defense and we were in U.S. military bases um, in France a couple times when I was growing up. Uh, so I learned French. Um, I learned some German in college and then I decided I wanted to learn Chinese. Oh, I learned Wolof and Peace Corps. But it's not widely spoken outside of Senegal. But then I started to learn Chinese and uh, use my meager Peace Corps savings to pay for a summer at Middlebury and somehow talk the Foreign Service into sending me straight out to language school when I got in. Um, there's, everybody speaks English now in the world. You can get around, you can talk to people, you can talk to people about serious and difficult things, uh, particularly educated people in diplomacy or government or business. But it's not the same as talking in their own language. There's, there, it's not just subtleties, it's sort of the freedom of expression and the sincerity of the voice. That when you're talking to people in their own language, you hear a lot more than when you're talking to them in English. There tends to be a sort of giving you the line when people are talking in English and when you're talking to them in whatever their own language is. Uh, it's a much different understanding <coughs> of what motivates them and what they want. And I found talking to people in Chinese, particularly when you go down to Wenzhou and you go to the button market, uh, or you know, when you're drinking beer in Taipei with officials, uh, it made a big difference. Um, you know, Kathy Stevens, who we're here with at some of the events, she speaks Korean. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea. I think that makes a real difference because on the surface, Korea is really easy for us to understand. There's a lot of very sophisticated Koreans, international business people who speak tremendously good English. There's Korean Americans who speak both. But I really think being able to talk to a lot of different people, particularly the less sophisticated, less international ones in their own language makes a big difference. So learn a language if you get the opportunity. And join Peace Corps. If I haven't mentioned that before. Thank you so much, Professor Bushner. It's just incredible. I'm sure you guys uh, soak this all in. I mean, it's just incredible. I'm a naturalized citizen of Sport in South Africa, so this is just so perfect for me because I have a view from the other side. Okay. Yeah. But I hope you're inspired, and I hope you think about the Peace Corps, and I hope you hope to think about serving our nation 